A father of two is killed in his hotel room on the Las Vegas Strip at the hands of a cold-blooded killer. Um, I mean, he basically told police that he was looking to kill someone. You know, and uh, here's another quote, for the kicks of it, I guess. I mean, who says that? Right. You know, he, right. Frank Rosenstock was just someone who got on his radar. You know, they trapped him in his hotel room. He posed as a, a, a detective coming in to arrest him for soliciting prostitution and then ended up strangling him to death. The killer was put to death, and I was one of the few people in the room to witness him die. This is the trial and execution of Lawrence Caldwell Jr. Investigators, you're on deadline. From the social distancing studios in Las Vegas, Nevada, to your ear holes, this is True Crime Deadline, a podcast discussing cold cases, murder, mysteries, and completely random thoughts. Now your host, a man who sings happy birthday twice when washing his hands, Mr. Mystery himself, Matt Johnson. Investigators, welcome to Season 2 of True Crime Deadline. As you heard Mr. Announcer Man there mention, I'm coming to you from the new, air quotes, social distancing studio in Las Vegas, Nevada, where my crime-fighting canine, Mr. Gatsby, and I are riding out the pandemic. I have pictures of him on social media. We both hope that you're well and you're staying positive. For this season, I've had access to some amazing interviews and less talked about cases, including this one. It's a case that I've really never opened up about, never really talked about before. Sure, I've seen a lot of dead bodies. I've covered a lot of death as a reporter over the last two decades. But this is on a whole new level. I was witness to an execution of a convicted killer. He didn't didn't say anything at all. He didn't try to mouth the words, I'm sorry. I mean, there's just nothing, nothing right up to the end. Just cold, you know, a cold, cruel killer. That's John Huck, a longtime friend and colleague in the world of TV news. Currently, he's the main anchor of Fox 5 in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm interviewing him because John was also in the room with me when Lawrence Caldwell Jr. was executed by way of lethal injection on March 26, 2004 in Carson City, Nevada. John and I have known each other for decades, but we have never talked about this case until now. You know, when we just think about this story, I just keep on going back to the fact that um, it's just kind of surreal to have done our job, but also see someone die. You know, I just think that that is like a right. weird thing. And it must be well, for everybody else there as well. You know, we cover stories where people die all the time, unfortunately. Uh, but this is a case where this is the state taking the life of a person. Um, and when you say it like that, it sounds very wrong and very, you know, something like, well, this isn't what should happen. But again, this is a guy who took the life of a retired furrier, um, who was out here on vacation and made the mistake of entering a conversation and trying to solicit sex from a woman who was hooked up with this guy. And it was, you know, he walked right into their trap and Lawrence Caldwell had it in his mind that he was going to kill this person. He just wanted to know what it was like. Now let's be clear this episode, not about the death penalty, in context of it being right or wrong. So save your emails. This episode for mature audiences, and it's my personal take on a crime story, what it was like to witness an execution firsthand. And make no mistake about it, the man that we're talking about, the killer, was evil. On March 10th, 1994, Lawrence Caldwell Jr. murdered 76-year-old Frank Rosenstock with his belt just to see what it was like to kill a man. Rosenstock was a retired fur trader in New York and on vacation in Vegas when he met Caldwell's girlfriend, Marilee Paul. As part of a trap to rob Rosenstock, Paul lured him back to his hotel room at the Tropicana under the false pretense they were going to have sex. A few minutes later, She let Caldwell into the room where he handcuffed Rosenstock and strangled him dead with his belt. They left the body there for the cleaning staff to find. After the murder, Lawrence Caldwell and his girlfriend fled up to Oregon where Caldwell grew up. At some point, she turned on him. Paul confessed to the crime and turned herself in. 
She testified against her lover for a plea deal that she be sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole. Caldwell, however, pleaded guilty to robbery, burglary, and first-degree murder. He told the sentencing panel that he planned to kill someone for weeks before he came across Rosenstock. He told the panel that he killed him for kicks, and it was like taking a walk in the park or driving down the street. That easy. After losing an appeal at the state level, he waived any further appeals and then asked the court to be put to death. In 2004, he got his wish. The state of Nevada had resumed executions. And then, you know, so you get into the debate, well, does Lawrence Caldwell deserve any, any mercy? But the state of Nevada never wanted to put him to death initially. Uh, but he comes back to them with this offer, you know, I'll plead guilty and I'll spare you the trial. All you have to do is put me to death. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's kind of like suicide by state in a way. You know, you, you hear suicide by cop where a guy raises his weapon and the police have no choice. This guy, you know, raised the specter of saving the state, you know, a lot of resources. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, okay, we're going to try him. He's ready to plead guilty. You know, but, you know I think a public defender, I think, who argued um, against all of this in court said, look, he's manipulating us, you know, to do, you know, what he wants. And we shouldn't be playing into it. But, right. you know, the Supreme, this Nevada Supreme Court found otherwise. I think it's an interesting story from that perspective, too, you know, that, that, that legal perspective of how someone can kind of dictate his own terms in, in that fashion. You know, it's one you oftentimes you enter a plea deal and you agree to plead guilty to spare yourself a longer sentence or a harsher sentence. This guy was entering a plea deal to give him the to make sure he got the ultimate. Yeah, the ultimate sentence. Right. And it goes back to, you know, what you said earlier. He had no um, regard for any human life, including his own. So no, he, that. he wanted out. He wanted to take someone, you know, he wanted to take someone out. He's, he remarked how easy it was. He said something like it was as easy as driving down the street. I mean, who says that? I like, know. Take a life and that, and that's your, that's your reaction. Oh, it's just like driving down the street. I mean, this guy was clearly a sociopath. No, but I think no it would have been it. 100%. I think it would have been uh, easier to cover and um, would have left a different impression in our mind if we were there and had covered the initial murder that he did, because we didn't cover that part. Like we were not there for that. No. And that's, I mean, it was a 10 year gap really between the murder and the execution, but everybody else in that room had that in their mind. Before execution day, myself and the other reporters like John were given access to the state prison. And it's a lot to take in. The prison is one of the oldest that is still operating in the United States, built in 1862 by the prisoners themselves from a stone quarry on site. The prison quarry also provided the same stone for the state capitol building. I want to say the prison looks something out of an old movie, part Shawshank Redemption, part Alcatraz. There have been several executions there, some by gunfire, some by gas, and most by lethal injection, and that was the case here, lethal injection. I remember walking through several iron gates, several cell doors, and seeing men on top of towers with guns. I walked through the yard, past some cells, and into the sterile-looking room the execution was going to take place. I can still see the phone on the wall and the bright blue painting, the trim around the windows for the observation room on the other side. And leading up to all of this, I'm reporting on the last meal, the process of the execution. I have an interview with the warden, but I guess I'm expecting it not to happen at all because it could have been called off at any time. um, It was an interesting story to cover. It was surreal. Uh, I remember it was you, me, um, a reporter from, I I believe, 13. Um, And, you know, we were kind of ushered around the prison. We were given a tour. Uh, I mean, we were right out there in the prison yard with the inmates working out. I remember that part, <laughs> thinking, well, <laughs> I just have to run faster than Matt if things go south. <laughs> right. Well, and I remember we couldn't wear blue because at the time, you know, the prison inmates were wearing jeans and blue shirts. And that's how they could, like, keep us. They can eye us really quickly in case things went bad. And it was right. like something out of a movie. This is a very old, 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 old prison in Carson City, the state capital in Nevada. 
And the prison inmates in the like 1800s or something chiseled out the, the stone. It's like Shawshank Redemption. It's really mm-hmm. a creepy place. Hi, friends. We are Carl and Joanne, and our podcast is Goldilocks and the Silver Fox. In our lighthearted podcasts, we share our unique ability to find humor in our marriage, adventures, and everyday life. Everything from crashing cars, practical jokes, unique blend of sarcasm, Joanne's ADHD, Carl's ability to be annoyed and entertained at the same time. If you need a little laughter and want to have some fun, find us on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you upload your podcasts. We are also on YouTube. Just search Goldilocks and the Silver Fox. Goldilocks and the Silver Fox. Goldilocks and the Silver Fox. It, it is right out of something you'd see in a movie. And I, what I remember is it's right in the mountains of Carson City, and there was still snow uh, up on the mountains. And thinking, well, at least they have a nice view. Because oftentimes, you know, prison's out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, this, you know, this was, could be classified as the middle of nowhere, certainly, but it was a little bit more, I don't know, I guess, Old West. Uh, and you're right. And, you know, and they gave us really a, a level of transparency that you just don't see anymore with these prisons. I mean, I've dealt with them on some other death penalty cases last year and just nothing like the access we had when we were up there in 2004. Right. And um, the reason why they were making a big deal about it is because they had stopped executions in the state of Nevada for a while. Right. So the last one had been like three years or four years prior. And this is why they had that media day. What do you remember about uh, the day before um, the execution of this killer that we covered? Well, my, I, my impressions were the, the warden was very friendly and uh, approachable. I remember being in that in that workout area with the inmates really just maybe 50 to a hundred feet from us. They were working out. They were kind of spying us suspiciously as they should have. And then giving, being given the tour of the prison, thinking to myself, wow, this place is really old. And then finally the death chamber uh, where Lawrence Caldwell was going to be put to death the next day. And, you know, it was just, it was very sterile. But again, the level of transparency that they gave us, is just something you, you don't really see these days. And you're right, this, you know, the, they had put a pause on executions, and you'll recall that Lawrence Caldwell said, look, I will go ahead and plead guilty to these murders, but you have to put me to death. This guy had no desire to spend the rest of his life in prison. And, in fact, he could have halted it at any time. Yeah, and we, we'll, we'll get into that part because, you know, I think mm-hmm. that all of us in the room were kind of waiting for the governor to, like, you know, the phone to ring or something cinematic to, to put right, a stop right. to it. Right. And, you know, they remember the attorney general was there, uh, Brian Sandoval, who later became the governor, and uh, then District Attorney David Roger. They were both witnesses there with us in the execution chamber. So they were ready to, you know, they could have stepped in had this guy indicated like, hey, I don't want to die. What, how would you describe that room where he ended up dying? So there's a glass wall where you know, there's a room full of the family of the victim and his his family could have been there, but they chose not to be, obviously. And then there was the media and then there was the, the folks that you mentioned and the attorneys. And then on the other side is this bizarre room with this like padded bed. And mm-hmm. yeah, it was very cold and very sterile. And there was that padded bed there. And it was just a few other people other than uh, than Cowell. There was, um, I, I believe, two guards and someone, you know, from the medical field to administer, I shouldn't even say the medical field. I don't know what their background was, but they were administering the, uh, the drug cocktail that would kill him. So, yeah, and we were all in this kind of viewing area that was kept very dark. I remember it being very dark and I didn't, I don't think I made eye contact or I couldn't make eye contact with the uh, family of the victim. And you're right. His mother was in town at the time, but she did not uh, witness the execution she did get to visit with her son, and she was there to bring his body back to wherever she laid him to rest. But you have to admit, I mean, that's pretty admirable for a, a parent, a mother making that final journey with their son. It, it could not have been easy. Of course it wasn't easy, uh, but right. she's there. Yeah, and you spoke with her. So you're a reporter down in Las Vegas, and, you know, this is a big statewide story. So 
you and the other big stations in Las Vegas fly up or, or head up to Carson City, the state capital. I'm working in Reno at the time, so that's just mm-hmm. about a 45-minute drive. And you actually sat down with, with his mom. What was that like? You know, she could not have been more nice. I mean, it would have been completely justifiable for her to tell us to get lost, you know, and how dare you, you know, even approach me. But we were tipped off that she was at this hotel, you know, I didn't come barging in there with a camera. You know, I knocked on the door and I I basically said, look, I'm sorry, you have to go through this. Would you want to sit down and talk to us about this? Because, I mean, it's, it's, it's a perspective that I think, you know, our viewers would want to hear. Something you certainly don't hear from is a parent of a condemned person. And she couldn't have been more gracious. And she basically said, you know, I feel the family's pain because I lost a family member in a similar fashion. Uh, I've been a victim of a murder. And she's like, you know, I can't believe what my son did, but he'll always be my, he had a, she had a nickname for him, like, he'll always be my little bug or something. So, you know, you, you could tell she still loved him despite everything. Yeah, but, you know, I, I give her, I give her a lot of respect for doing what she did and, and making sure that he was brought back to wherever he was laid to rest. It would have been easy just to tell the state of Nevada, you know, put him wherever you want. We're done. We have a clip of that report. It was a really good report. And she also shared a picture that they had just taken. Yeah. And he had gotten a haircut. And I remember one of his final requests was that he had his teeth cleaned. Kind of weird, right? I mean, you're being put to death and you want to undergo a teeth cleaning, which sometimes isn't the most, you know, pleasant experience if you, you know, you sit in a dentist chair. So, right. but yeah, I mean, he was well, you know, he was well groomed and shaven. And that was a nice picture of him and his mom. Anywhere else, you'd think it was just sort of a reunion between a mom and a son, you know, but it was, he was just a few days away from dying when that picture was taken. Yeah. And again, you know, he's wearing regular clothes because at the time they're not wearing like jumpsuits and things like that, like you see nowadays. So it Mm -hmm. would look like any picture taken anywhere. Yeah. Other than, you know, kind of a sterile background, kind of a prisony background. Now, when Fox 5 heard that I was doing this episode, they gave me special access to the archives and sent me John's report. It's a report that has not seen the light of day in 16 years. So thank you to them. And it opens up with Caldwell's mom, Ruby Colt. She is an older woman wearing rose-colored glasses. She has a red sweatshirt on with an iron-on of two cats and a broken heart in between them. She's sitting there. John's on the other bed. He's asking her questions. And she's opening up about talking to her son as time is ticking. Well, I cried a couple of tears today after I left, but other than that, I'm holding up pretty good. And Ruby Culp says she won't ask her son, Lawrence Colwell, to appeal his death sentence. This is his choice, and, well, I've backed him 35 years, so why stop now? The 61-year-old spends her days this week either holed up in a cramped Carson City motel room or holed up in a maximum security prison, spending time with her son as the clock ticks away to his death sentence. This picture of the two taken just yesterday. He's still my boo-boo-goo. That's what I call call it, boo. Ruby knows her love for her youngest son can't change what he did, strangling to death Frank Rosenstock in a Tropicana hotel room 10 years ago. But Ruby does share a certain bond with the Rosenstock family. I lost a loved one in the same way that they lost a loved one. She was strangled. And it really hits home, I'll tell you. Ruby will have one more visit with Caldwell before he's transferred to cell B1 Friday afternoon. At 9 in the evening, after a final meal of cheeseburgers and pizza, Prison guards will escort Colwell a few steps into the execution chamber. Then, after he's strapped in, a staff member will stand in this room and pump drugs into Colwell's arms through tubes leading through these holes. If all goes as planned, Colwell will be gone in a matter of seconds. The last inmate executed here was dead in less than a minute. You generally don't face someone who wants to end their own life. Mace Yampolsky was Colwell's attorney during his sentencing. Yampolsky remembers the chill he felt when Colwell threw down the gauntlet to the judges. If you don't give me the death penalty, I will kill again. They get to a certain point, maybe he feels that he, you know, doesn't want to do prison time anymore. I don't know. I don't know what's going through his mind. On the day of Colwell's execution, the prison will go into lockdown. A few miles away, Ruby Culp will wait for that phone call from the warden, telling her it's happened. Brody's there and I've already got his burial plot and everything. I'm ready to take him home. I'm not leaving Nevada without him. 
So, yeah, that was the report that you did for Fox 5 Las Vegas. And, of course, I'll put a picture, uh, the picture that we're talking about, screen grab it and put it on the website, truecrimedeadline.com. How did you get assigned the story? I, you know, they just came to me and said, look, uh, this guy is being put to death. We want you to cover the execution. I was, at the time, um, you know, I'm, I'm the weekday evening anchor now. At the time, I was doing weekends, and I was probably maybe more their more senior re- reporter that I'd been in the business a little bit longer than some of the other reporters. Not saying I was any better than them, but I guess maybe they just thought I could. You know, it, it's a story where like you're setting someone up to witness an execution. So they perhaps maybe thought that I was going to be able to, you know, deal with it better. I, you know, which is not true. I mean, I worked with some very talented people at the time and they could have easily done just a, a, a good a job, if not better than me, but they had sent me. And I remember telling my dad that, uh, you know, Hey, I'm being sent up to Carson city to cover an execution. And my dad, you know, was an attorney and he said, why would you want to cover that? So he had the wisdom of his years, but I think, I think it was a good story for me to recover as a reporter, just to kind of, you know, kind of broaden your perspective on that topic and, and see what it is like and, and what the process is. And I, I think you would agree with me on that too, right? Well, I wanted to be there to witness history and to be part of a big mm-hmm. story and, and to see it. But um, I've never been able to talk to anybody about it because no one else would really understand. That's why I was really looking forward to talking to you about it. It's just such an odd experience and a lot of soul searching afterwards. You know, I was thinking about like, oh, my God, you know, I witnessed someone get killed, you know, and then you think about, well, we didn't kill him. We were just witnessing this murderer, you know, be put to death for what he did. You know, it's just such a strange thing that you ping pong back and forth in your mind sometimes, or at least I do. I don't think it changed my mind about the death penalty, per se, witnessing it. I mean, you hear these horror stories in the news where the inmates, they botched the execution and the inmate suffers. Uh, This wasn't that. This was very, it seemed to me, very by the book. Outwardly, he showed no sign of distress as he was being put to death. You know, he simply, you know, he took a couple deep breaths and then he's closed his eyes. And, you know, a short time later, they pronounced him dead. We were ushered out of the viewing area it was almost kind of like that was it you know there were no fight he he gave no final words he made no eye contact you know and i remember looking around and everyone was very somber and respectful of the process he had uh brian sandoval who was the attorney general of nevada at the time later to become governor and uh, david roger who has been district attorney for clark county down here where las vegas is and uh, they were just very somber and i I believe, you know, and then I remember the next day at the airport, Matt, uh, David Roger was waiting for a flight back to Las Vegas with me. And he actually came up and asked what I thought, you know, and I, 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 I think I shared with him the same impressions that I shared with you. Yeah, I thought it was a very peaceful process. And I think that the killer that we're talking about, he's a murderer, um, mm-hmm. Lawrence Caldwell Jr. I think, you know, we know that he wanted to die. He could have stopped the process. He told them that, I have a quote here, I can't stay here. I'm 100% for this. I don't want to die, but I, there's no value in my life now. It's over. You know, something of that nature. So he could have stopped this process. He wanted to die. But I think that what we were all waiting for in that room was some sort of remorse, some, you know, some final words for the family that had flown in from the East Coast the victim's family and his children. But this guy didn't, didn't have any last words. He just stopped breathing. It was just kind of, is yeah. that it? You know, clearly he was someone who didn't respect life. He didn't respect other people's lives. He didn't respect his own. Um, I mean, he basically told police that he was looking to kill someone, you know, and uh, here's another quote for the kicks of it, I guess. I mean, he says that, right. You know, he, right. Frank Rosenstock was just someone who, got on his radar, you know, they trapped him in this hotel room. He posed as a, a, a detective coming in to arrest him for soliciting prostitution and then ended up strangling him to death. I mean, this was, I mean, you know, he was, this was a premeditated murder. You know, the state of Nevada had no interest in putting him to death, uh, but he, he didn't have any respect for his life either. He just wanted out. 
So, I mean, it, it's interesting to think, well, I wonder what happened, you know, in his whole upbringing, you know, that brought right. him to this point. Especially because, by all accounts, that interview that you did with his mom, she just seemed, quote unquote, normal. She, she had a nickname for him, like you said, and she was just mm-hmm. there as his mom. So it's very yeah, sad she, for I mean, her. She, very sad. Clearly, she loved him. But, you know, as we know, you, we've covered these so many stories, Matt, that you just don't know what a person's upbringing is. You know, what was the family life like? What was the father like? What else happened that might have just set him on this course? Was it mental illness? Who knows? You know, it could have been a hundred different things. Did anyone ever say anything to you after? It, it happened late. We, we make it through the security. And, you know, you're going to head to your camera. I'm going to head to my camera. Mm-hmm. There is a, this wall of protesters. And it seemed like there are more, right. there more than was reported in the newspaper. When I'm looking up clips of this uh, for my research, it said something like 40 people from different churches from the Reno area. What do you remember mm-hmm. about that? I, I remember the protesters. I, I don't think I had any interaction with them. You know, just I think we did interview one or two of them for the story. I'm sure we did. But again, you know, we, we stayed there long enough to do the live shot. We only did a 10 o'clock then, no 11. And then we, I do remember we covered the vehicle that took his body out of the prison. Mm. And then, and that, I think that was it for the night, but it was late. I remember that. It, just like you said, we were scrambling to get something on the air uh, that night. You know, the report that you were showing your, your listeners, that was done the, the day before where we had, some, right. we had the luxury of time. In the media day, so to speak, you know. Um, right. And we have to really remember back to this is before smartphones, iPhones, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Like we were using big, huge trucks that look like yeah. motorhomes with a satellite dish on it. And we're in like very rural Carson City, kind of rural. It, it's just a very different way of technology back then. And it wasn't even really that was. long ago. Yeah. And it was before the age of social media. There was nothing, you know, you wouldn't tweet anything. There were no selfies. You, know, you didn't take pictures on your camera, as you mentioned. Uh, I think, you know, the, the, I had a flip phone maybe at that time, if that. <laughs> yeah, I don't even remember what kind of phone I would have had. But, um, you know, yeah. you're the seasoned reporter, and this is like a big story for me. I remember that. And I was just trying to get through it. And we have all of these protesters around us that are against the death penalty. And I don't Uh think I interviewed them or the one sole counter protester that was there for pro death penalty was holding a sign saying, this is the old West, hang him high. He doesn't deserve to be with us is what he said. So there was just this one guy and a mob of, you know, church going folks that were trying to stop it and, and I just think that that's interesting that there wasn't more, it wasn't as balanced, you know? Right. Well, I mean, and again, you know, Lawrence Caldwell was not fighting for his life. So, it, I mean, this execution was brought about by Lawrence Caldwell. So, I mean, for anyone to come out there and say, yeah, we agree with Lawrence is just a little weird. Um, it's right. not like, you know, and the victim was back from back east, I think New York or New Jersey. Correct. So, I mean, he didn't have he didn't have family in the community. I mean, had it been, you know, someone from Reno or someone from Las Vegas, I could see more of a pro death penalty um, protest position happening. Especially if this guy, if, you know, the murder was any murder is heinous, but you know, especially you know, if, if this guy had fought you know, the process and try to spare his own life in the process. You might have seen more people coming out saying, no, he needs to be put to death for what he did. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, this guy wanted to die. Executions were stayed for a while and stayed in Nevada. And then they came back around and he told his attorneys that he wanted to die and he didn't want to be behind bars. So Mm -hmm. that's, that's exactly right. So um, I was looking up his last meal, and I I covered this, and we all covered this on the day before, but his last meal was pizza, a cheeseburger, some fruit, and a cola. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder what kind of pizza they get him. (laughs) I mean, do they they splurge and get him something nice, or is it like, oh, here's your cheese pizza? No, I envisioned that um, back then that it was probably the inmates cooking the food in the kitchen. 
Oh, okay. Which is so kind of me- psychological for the other inmates that are having to deliver or cook this food. I never thought of that. That 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 meal would be prepared in house. I mean, I would want fast food or something, but I'm. <laughs> I, I would be like, yeah, I don't want it made here. I want something made from the outside. Right. I want you to go out to, um, you know, Ruth Chris. <laughs> I want you to go out to steak, you know, and bring me something in. I want something from brought in from the outside. Is it something you ever think about? Once in a while, I will, you know, and, and again, it goes back to the images I had witnessing it. Not so much the interview with the mother, uh, not so much afterwards, you know, rushing to do the live shot. It was the moments in that room, seeing him brought in, seeing him strapped in, seeing him close his eyes, um, looking around, seeing Sandoval and David Rogers staring straight ahead. Um, and just the quietness of that room more than anything, just the stillness and the quietness in that room. And it's something, especially I'll think of Matt is, you know, when I do read about an execution or watch a story about an execution, I'll remember back to this experience. I think so too. Uh, And that's the same for me. And I'm glad that, you know, we had been friends before we covered this together and I'm glad that you were there with me. I'm glad that, you know, we have someone that was there with us that we knew. It's a weird story and it helps, you know, and it's, it's, you know, at the end of the day, you and I are humans, you know, sometimes, you know, reporters get accused of being callous and cold. Um, and, that, and it's not true. I mean, we're all human and we, you know, we, you know, we have values, you know, you and I, just like everyone else, you know, we value human life and I'm not going to ask you your opinion of the death penalty, but um, you know, it's something that we don't take lightly. We certainly don't take a story like this lightly. You know, even if you're pro death penalty, I can't see, except for that one lone guy saying we hang him high. I mean, I don't think most even pro death penalty proponents feel that way. It's more of a case like, you know, that's not, you don't apply it in every case, but in a case like Lawrence Caldwell, a guy who, you know, had no regard for the life of Frank Rosenstock, a guy who had no regard for his own life. You know, maybe you just say, you you'd say, okay, in this case, we'll apply it. And, but again, you don't do it lightly and you are respectful of the process and you, 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 know, you want to give this guy the condemned, at least the dignity, you know, that any human would deserve, you know, even though he didn't really, you know, didn't express a desire to have that for himself. Well, the last that murder that he committed, yeah, totally. The last murder that he committed was himself. True, true. That's true. That's a good way of putting it. I mean, it was, it, it was a suicide, you know, by the hands of the state. He, I mean, he, he, he brought, he brought all this you know, on himself. You know, he could have called it off at any time. That's the, that's the amazing thing when an inmate can spare his own life and chooses not to. Yeah. And I think that's the ultimate selfishness about Lawrence Caldwell, you know, not only did he take this life so callously of Frank Rosenstock's, but then he refuses to, you know, learn from it, to pay his debt to society the way that the state thought he should have. You know, he just wants that quick, easy exit. It's like, nope, I'm done. Goodbye. I had my, I had my thrill. I'm out. Which is why he didn't even give closure to the children. Of he, he never gave, he, yeah, he never, he could have said, yeah, well, I'm glad that he didn't say anything callous to make it worse. Um, Correct. But, but he didn't say but anything at all. Yeah. He didn't, he didn't say anything at all. He didn't try to mouth the words, I'm sorry. I mean, there's just nothing, nothing right up to the end. Just cold, you know, a cold, cruel killer. So it just goes to that whole thing where we see the best and the worst of right. people as reporters, so as I, witnesses of history. So for every Lawrence Caldwell, there are hundreds, thousands, millions of people like the ones we saw at the Route 91 Harvest Festival who shielded their loved ones from the bullets, who helped perfect strangers get into cars, who strangers pulled over and took those people you know, to the nearest ER and the doctors and the nurses just work tirelessly. I mean, that's, that's, those are the kind of people 
who you need to remember, especially as we go through these tumultuous times that, you know, there is goodness. There is so much goodness. And it's so easy to get caught up in, you know, the Lawrence Caldwells of the world because there's, you know, there are psychopaths. And that's intriguing to us as reporters to see what, why are you a psychopath? But mm-hmm. I think at the end of the day, you have to remember that so many people are good. We really need to remember that. I think it gets us through the day sometimes, don't you? I do. And I think that you do a good job of that at your your station that you work for, um, Fox 5. And I worked there for a brief time, and I'm proud of that. You did. Um, But you guys do several things. I was just watching you guys did another blood drive, you know, Take 5 to Care. And not all bad news uh, on TV will remind people of that. And people turned out. They sold out. I mean, not sold out, but they filled up all the appointments. Uh, even though we're in the middle of a pandemic, people came right on down. They had no problem. And it's just, again, it just shows you the, the, the caringness of the community. So it's a well, wonderful place to live. Yeah. And uh, you're a very caring person. I know that. I'm happy to know you. And thank you for, for talking about this and for, you know, telling people's stories every day. Thanks for doing what you do. Well, Matt, th- it's you know it, it's it's my pleasure to know you. You're a terrific storyteller. Your your podcast is terrific. You've won awards. I think it's great that you you're pursuing this. I mean, I think uh, you know these stories. There's, I mean, people are into it because you know we all have that kind of you know voyeuristic tendency about like how how did that happen? Who is this person? You know, and there's nothing wrong with it. You know. You, you, it's just, it's a side of life that not many of us will ever be touched by. And we want to keep it that way. But still, we want to, I think we're, at the end of the day, we're humans and we're interested in how other humans tick. You know? Absolutely. And so th- this guy will be a case study, uh, you know, for, <laughs> I don't know, psychiatry students <laughs> for years to come. What makes a psychopath like this? have so little regard for other, other lives and their own, their own lives. Well, thank you again for talking to me. Thank you, Matt. It's my pleasure. Now, I did reach out to the Rosenstock family, telling them about the podcast. I haven't heard back. I'll keep you posted. As for Caldwell's mother, she did take him home. She has since passed and is buried in the same family plot as her son. I posted pictures from the case and court on my website, truecrimedeadline.com. I'm also going to post John Huck's report from 16 years ago on my social media accounts. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, and also YouTube under True Crime Deadline. Investigators, until next time. Thank you for investigating True Crime Deadline with Matt Johnson. For more information about the podcast, visit truecrimedeadline.com. And remember, all tips regarding a case should go to the police. Until next time. Mr. Gatsby, want a cookie? Good boy. Now a post-episode shout-out to investigators who wrote reviews on Apple Podcasts. Again, writing reviews really helps independent podcasts like this one get noticed. We're up against networks, studios, TV channels, you name it. So thank you. It's easy. It's free. Just hit 5-star, subscribe, tell a friend, write a review, and include your real name and your podcast if you're a podcaster and you're going to get a shout-out. So this one comes from Log Home Mama who writes, Excellent. Most podcasts, even those I truly enjoy, have at least one drawback, in my opinion. Not this one. Unless you count Needs More Episodes. Thumbs up. Thumbs up to you. Um, Thank you for the review. We're going to have plenty of new episodes. We're starting season two here. And um, now I want to share with you some of the podcasts that I'm listening to that I'm a fan of, including Ignorance Was Bliss and Just the Tipsters. Take a listen. Hello, tipsters. This is Melissa Morgan, the host of Just the Tipsters, America's favorite true crime podcast, because people are awful and kill each other. Hi, tipsters. This is Melissa Morgan, host of Just the Tipsters, America's favorite true crime podcast. Have you ever wanted to kill someone? Hey, yo, tipsters. This is Melissa Morgan, host of America's favorite true crime podcast, Just the Tipsters. And what makes Just the Tipsters America's favorite true crime podcast? It's because I said so. That's why. That's okay, right? I can say that. I mean, guard. Just the Tipsters with Melissa Morgan is available on Apple Podcasts. 
Spotify, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Stitcher, the Radio.com app, and wherever pods are cast. Subscribe, rate, review. You'll be glad you did. Hey, this is Kate. I'm a forensic psychologist and crisis clinician, and I collect stories. Everything from true crime to trauma to parenthood. There's a lot more in common between depression and sociopathy, or between serial killers and podcasters, than you might think. Are you sure you really want to know? This is Ignorance Was Bliss at iwbpodcast.com and iwbpodcast on social media.